Hi, and welcome to this Revival Animal Health webinar on managing the valuable brood female. Joining us today, we have Dr. Marty Greer, Director of Veterinary Services with Revival Animal Health, and she will be giving us some of the nuances to help you improve the reproductive capabilities of your breeding females. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Greer. And thanks for having me. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have quite a bit of material to cover, so I want to make sure that we get this all into a time period that we can make it fit. All of our contact information, as you can see, is here on the screen, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and roll. So my questions are for you are going to be this, this afternoon, how would you like to get a big litter when you've bred 26 females out of 25 of them? That's a pretty good percentage, don't you think, to have big litters? How about, would you like to prevent diarrhea in your puppies? Wouldn't that be awesome not to have puppies with diarrhea? So I wanna just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Marty Greer, as Shelley said. I'm an Iowa State graduate from 1981. I work for Revival Animal Health as part of what I do, but I'm also a full-time veterinary practitioner in a small animal practice in Lamira, Wisconsin. I've been lucky enough to work with breeder clients for the last 38 years absolutely love it. I turned into a breeder myself shortly after I started practicing. I think that's kind of how we all ended up with this many breeder clients. Um, so I breed Pembroke Welsh Corgis and on the left of the screen you can see Patty, one of my Pembrokes. And then on the right hand side of the screen is Yamania, one of my Danish Swedish farm dogs. So I've imported three farm dogs from Sweden and I also have those in a breeding program. So today we're gonna to talk about maximizing breeding potential in your females. Of course, the males are important too, but we're just gonna cover the girls today. So the things we're gonna cover initially are going to be physical condition of the female, health screening, vaccinations, nutrition, parasite control for both the female and the puppies, environment for the female and the puppies, and timing our breeding. So first we want to talk about physical condition of our female. It's really important that they're at ideal body condition, neither too thin nor overweight at the time that we want her to go into heat and start becoming reproductively active. This chart is a nice chart. It gives you a scale of one through nine of what body condition scores look like. So you can see one, two, and three in the yellow are too thin. Those are females that are too thin. So if you were to take the back of your hand make it into a fist and feel across your knuckles, that's what her rib cage would feel like if she's too thin. So we don't wanna be able to feel ribs as thin as this. Ideal body condition is going to be what you'd feel on the heel of your hand. That's in the green to just kind of into the orange, the five, four, five, and six range. And then once they become overweight, then we really get into where they're just too chubby. So we wanna make sure that they're not that heavy. So we, we wanna make sure that we can feel ribs, but not just feel squishy. Uh, the female in this picture, of course, is pregnant and not in an ideal body condition, even though it looks like she's got quite a distended abdomen and she's very full of puppies, you can see her uh, backbone is showing. So that tells us that she's actually underweight in spite of the excessive amount of puppy and fluid that she's carrying in her abdomen. So this is an actual photograph of a dog that we took at our practice. This is not an ideal situation for her or for the puppies. So we wanna be sure that our girls are at their right body condition. However, we don't wanna put them on a diet at the time that we're going to start breeding. We wanna make sure that she's ideal going into a heat cycle, not too thin and not too heavy. The second thing I wanna mention is health screening. And we'll talk about a couple of things, but primarily brucellosis, canine brucellosis, is a disease, a bacterial disease that we see in dogs. It still exists. It hasn't been eradicated from the United States and most countries from around the world. So it's really important that we're still keeping an eye on these dogs for canine brucellosis. It is a bacterial disease, like I mentioned, but it is also a bacterial disease that is zoonotic, meaning that it can be transmitted to people. And it's of particular concern if we have young children, older people who are immunocompromised or a woman who may be pregnant. So very, very important that we're testing for this, not only for the sake of our dogs, but for the sake of the people that handle them as well. Testing for canine brucellosis is relatively simple. It can be done on a blood test in the veterinary clinic or as a send out test. 
if it's run in the hospital, it's simple to run. It takes less than two minutes to actually run the test itself. Of course, it takes longer than that to draw the blood, centrifuge it, separate it, and be ready to run the test. But it's a quick test. And this is called the rapid slide agglutination test that you can see here in the photo. Uh, the test kit has been on the market for well over 40 years. It's not a new test. It's a pretty great test in that it's very sensitive. It will pick up everything except very, very early brucellosis tests but it's not very specific. So you can't get both sensitivity and specificity in a test. You get one or the other. And in this case, we get sensitivity, meaning we'll get some false positives, but as far as specificity, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna get false positives because it'll pick up some other diseases as well. But the important thing is that it's not going to miss dogs that have an, any kind of um, infection lasting more than about three to four weeks from the time that they were um, originally uh, in, infected or exposed to the disease. So simple test to run, your veterinary clinic can run it, and if they can't, then you can get it sent out to a reference lab and get results back fairly quickly. However, because it is so sensitive, like I said, we see up to 10% false positives. If that happens, then an additional test is done, usually at Cornell, using the Auger Gel Diffusion Test, AGID test. That takes upwards of a week, depending on how long it takes to ship the sample to the lab, and that test is more uh, specific and will eliminate false positives. If that test comes back positive, you really truly do have a brucellosis positive dog, in which case in most states, your state veterinarian will be contacting you for a visit. Unfortunately, that means that you're probably going to end up with some problems with keeping some of the dogs that you have. So my question for you with this slide is, can you tell which dog is infected with canine brucellosis, Bru brucella canis? And the answer to that is really you can't. The dog with the eye problem, the dog that looks really thin, the puppy that looks really sick, any of those dogs could have canine brucellosis, but they can have one of a hundred other diseases as well, including things like parvovirus, parasites, other kind of diseases. The German Shepherd in the center of that slide very well could be the normal dog, or it could be the dog that's infected with brucellosis that's still asymptomatic. So you can't make any conclusions based on just an examination of the patient. This is a slide of puppies that have been aborted during a pregnancy. They've been aborted at different stages of the pregnancy. Brucellosis can do this, but so can canine herpes virus, leptospirosis. There's a lot of other diseases that can cause this. So if you see this, of course, brucellosis is one of the diseases that you want to test for, but this is not a foregone conclusion that you're going to come back positive for brucellosis. So don't jump to conclusions, but do allow your veterinarian to do the testing that's appropriate if brucellosis is on the list of differentials. So this is a photograph of some puppies. In March of last year, 2019, there were 27 dogs, little puppies that were exported from South Korea into Canada and then into Wisconsin as part of their transport to be placed into homes. The problem is they came in on legal papers, but 27 dogs were shipped out of Korea. They stopped in Canada. One of the dogs died when the, the uh, group of dogs was still in Canada. And by the time they got transported to Wisconsin, um, they had determined that the puppy that had died was positive for canine brucellosis. So this then became a real problem because those 26 dogs had already been placed in a humane society or multiple humane societies, had been commingled with other dogs, and two of those dogs turned out to be positive as well. One of those dogs ultimately ended up being euthanized, and as far as I know, the other one is still on house quarantine and will be essentially for the rest of its life. The problem is, you can't get rid of canine brucellosis once you get it in a dog. Um, it's permanent. It tends to live forever in their body. It's called undulant fever in people because this bacterial infection sets up housekeeping in your bone marrow and from time to time flares up and then comes back and then disappears again for a while. The drugs we used to have to treat this with are no longer on the market and spaying and neutering is not curative. So the problem is we had 100 dogs that were commingled. We had people that were exposed to this uh, group of dogs as well. So it becomes really complicated when you have a canine brucellosis situation. So it is important that we're preemptive and we're testing our dogs prior to breeding because if the state comes in to your facility and they are allowed to do so in almost every state because this is a reportable disease, it's one of the few canine reportable diseases we have um, besides rabies, but essentially what they do is they come in, test all the dogs in your house, your facility, your, your um, breeding program. Any dogs that are positive can be euthanized 
some of them are held out and tested repetitively every 30 days for a total of three tests, 90 days, and then they continue to test all the other dogs for a total of 90 days until you've got everybody clear. So once this happens in your facility, you no longer have control over what goes on with your dogs. You don't get to make those life and death decisions the state veterinarian does. So please be aware that this is a serious disorder and you wanna be testing for it proactively and not waiting until you're in trouble. Brucellosis can be spread dog to dog venereally by mating. It can be spread through, uh, uh, to people through secretions of the dog. This person in the center slide is holding a placenta, letting the dog eat it. So that's an exposure if you have a cut on your hand. Uh, it can also spread dog to dog through urine or other body fluids and the same with people. So it is really important that we're not just testing dogs that are breeding, but we're thinking about other dogs as well. So if they go to the dog park, if they go to a dog show, if they're transported, if you're transporting, um, for instance, rescue dogs um, or groups of dogs from one breeder to another in your vehicle and you have dogs in the vehicle with them that belong to you, those could be exposures. So be very, very careful with how you manage dogs that are not brucellosis screened. The second disorder that I want to talk about is going to be the tick-borne group of diseases. There is, again, another simple test that can be run in-house. There are several companies that run a test that includes heartworm, but it includes Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and ehrlichia as well. The concern we have with Lyme disease and the other two diseases that are tick-borne is that because they are tick-borne, we can see them year-round in most states. And females during pregnancy can become very, very sick with this uh, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and ehrlichia. So it's a good idea to have your females screened at least once a year or prior to the time that you breed them if you're in an area with a lot of ticks or if you're not really keeping up with your tick control with medication. The third disease that we can see is mycoplasma. Um, there are some dogs reported coming in from the Eastern European countries that do probably have mycoplasma. Many times treating the dogs if they've got some fertility issues with doxycycline, both male and female, can improve fertility in those dogs. So be aware that that's a concern. Um, so those are primarily the diseases that we can see that are infectious that can cause influences in uh, pregnancy and reproductive health. Um, there's a few other diseases as well, like I said, leptospirosis, but generally those are the diseases that we see. So the next thing I wanna talk about is vaccines. Um, vaccinations for distemper, adeno, parainfluenza, and parvo are really important that we keep active in our female dogs that we're using for breeding as well as the other dogs in the kennel. Um, parvo, of course, is one of those diseases in that vaccine, and parvo is still a, a pretty rampant disease in many breeding facilities and humane societies, um, shelters, and so on. So it's really important that we continue to vaccinate for parvo. Distemper we don't see much of in the northern states. It's still around in some of the southern states, but these are combination vaccines. They're very effective. They're very safe. We give a series of those to puppies when they're little. We vaccinate at six to eight weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 to 18 weeks and then an annual booster for most dogs. Dogs that aren't in breeding facilities may go to a three-year protocol, but dogs that are in breeding facilities where you've got a lot of puppies coming and going uh, should probably be test or vaccinated on an annual basis. Leptospirosis is a bacterial infection. There are four strains in the vaccines that we use now. Those are, again, much safer than they used to be. There are still some people who are a little bit reluctant to vaccinate for lepto but I still consider it to be a core vaccine in the, most of the states where we have possibilities of standing water and wet grass. I think if you live in Nevada, you're probably okay, maybe Arizona, but in general, the, the states that we see um, breeders in, we still see leptospirosis and that can spread to dogs that are pregnant and can cause serious illness during pregnancy. And of course, that can be fatal to young puppies. Bordetella is the third thing that we recommend vaccinating for that uh, comes as an intranasal, an oral, and an injectable vaccine. My preference is the intranasal combined with adenovirus and parainfluenza. Those are different adenovirus and virus and parainfluenza strains than we see in the injectable DAPP. So I still use the three-way Bordetella vaccine and I prefer the intranasal because you get better protection against um, Bordetella and you don't get any protection in the oral vaccine with Bordetella for parainfluenza, it's not available as an oral product. So if you're using one of these vaccines, you'll probably wanna to continue to use the three-way. My preference too is the syringe-free applicator that you can see here on the slide. The point of that being that if the intranasal vaccine is accidentally given 
as an injection, it can cause liver failure and pretty serious disease in the dog. So I think it's important that we make these as mistake-free as possible. If you make up a bunch of syringes and one of them is Bordetella, it's laying on the counter and you accidentally pick it up because one of your assistants or helpers or spouses or partners picked up the wrong vaccine and put it into a syringe and you give it by injection, it can cause very serious disease. So I like the syringe-free applicator. Um, if it can go wrong, it will. So the best way to do it is to make it as um, accident-proof as possible and that's to use the syringe-free applicator. The fourth vaccine that I wanna talk about is the canine influenza bivalent vaccine. There are two strains of canine influenza. There's an H3N2 and an H3N8. I like to use the bivalent vaccine. And in, again, in facilities where you have a lot of dogs coming and going and a lot of exposure, I think canine influenza is one of the vaccinations that you should be administering. Canine coronavirus is a little bit more of a different subject. We don't see much coronavirus in adult dogs. If we see it, it tends to be in young puppies that are around three to four weeks of age. It is an intestinal disease. It is not the same coronavirus that we see in humans. Uh, so it's a completely different strain. Um, it's still called corona because it has spikes on it. So when you look at it under the electron microscope, you can see it's in the coronavirus family but it is not contagious to humans. We've known about the um, enteric form of coronavirus since the 1990s. We've known about the respiratory form since 2003. Again, those are not contagious to people. The vaccine doesn't work on humans. The human vaccine, of course, doesn't exist at this time. So if you have a problem with canine coronavirus in two to three to four week old puppies with GI disease, you may wanna consider including that in your vaccine for your females, but in general, it's not considered a core vaccine in most facilities. So my question for you now is which vaccines are safe to use during pregnancy? And you may be looking at the screen going, oh, I, 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 I'm not really sure. Well, the answer to that is none. We don't vaccinate any of our female dogs during pregnancy for any vaccines, no, not for rabies, not for anything. In the European countries, there is a herpes virus vaccine. We do not have that in the United States. That's the only vaccine that's labeled for use during pregnancy. So since we don't have it here, we don't have to really uh, think too much about it, but I do want to mention it for our European colleagues. That's the Uricam 205. The fourth thing I want to talk about is nutrition. I want to talk about raw meat diet, carbohydrates, the pregnancy diet, puppy and performance diet, folic acid, DHA, B strong, and calcium. So nutritionally, um, I am not a fan of raw meat diets for a couple of reasons. One of them is the calcium phosphorus imbalance that we see because of the calcium in the uh, bones of the raw meat diet. That leads to a lot of dystocias. A dystocia is a difficult birth. So um, we have WebWise Data, a company in Cal uh, Colorado that does uterine contraction monitoring, and they see a much higher incidence of dogs that have inappropriate labors that are not effective in expelling puppies quickly in dogs that are on raw meat diets or on the um, grain-free diets. So I try to avoid those because of the calcium phosphorus imbalance. I also worry about parasites and bacterial diseases spread in raw meat. To me, it's something like kissing a pig. Uh, that's why I have this really graphic picture up here, is the parasites and bacteria that we see in raw meat diets can cause some pretty serious effects during pregnancy. Um, we can see salmonella, we can see um, shigella, we can see a number of other bacterial diseases, and we can see parasites like neosporum and toxoplasmosis and we can see entire litters of puppies lost to this. So I'm very, very careful. If people are really attached to their raw meat diet and it's because of the components of the diet, I would suggest that you try cooking it during the pregnancy. I know in some ways that defeats the purpose, but in other ways, at least you have the nutrient profile that you may be looking for, but you're avoiding the parasites and bacteria that we can see spread through raw meat. I also am concerned about raw meat handling in the kitchen. A lot of people are not careful with how they handle raw meat. Uh, whether they're cooking it for themselves or their families or for the dogs. So be very careful that you're using appropriate cutting boards that you can scrub and bleach, that you're washing your hands before you touch other things in the, in the kitchen, like the handle of the refrigerator or the towel. So be very careful with raw meat diets, whether they're um, yours or the dogs. The second thing I want to mention is carbohydrates. We know that our pregnant females and females that are lactating to produce milk for their puppies need to have carbohydrates. They need carbohydrates to grow their puppies in the uterus, and they need carbohydrates to lactate. So they cannot produce milk, they cannot make nice big fat puppies for you if they're on a carbohydrate-free diet. 
So grain-free diets make me a little nervous. Um, I prefer feeding carbohydrate diets that contain um, rice, barley, corn, wheat, uh, milo. All of those are appropriate unless your dog has allergies. And if you do have an allergic dog, you probably should talk to your veterinarian about how inherited that's likely to be sending it on to your puppy. So please, please, please look hard at the labels of your foods before you're feeding them um, that, that we're using an appropriate diet for the dogs that we're expecting to have puppies. The problem that we also see with the grain-free diets is we can see cardiomyopathy, which is a heart problem. There's a dilated cardiomyopathy that about 30% of the dogs on, um, with the cardiomyopathy seem to be related to a diet that's uh, grain-free. Um, there is a genetic form. There is a form that we haven't completely figured out, which are the other two forms. But around a third of the dogs that are developing these recent um, dilated cardiomyopathies are probably on a grain-free diet, which is a potato and pea-based diet. The other concern I have with peas isn't just the heart, but there's also a lot of phytoestrogens in the peas, legumes, and beans that are in these diets, which probably interfere with the female's fertility and potentially the males as well. We don't have as many studies on that as we should at this point, but those things will be coming. So please keep your ears open and try to avoid the bean, pea, and legume-based diets during pregnancy and lactation. So what should you feed your pregnant dog? Well, the answer to that is there's only one pregnancy diet on the market. There are a lot of people who very successfully feed Purina, Hills, and Royal Canin Yukonuba, and Iams diets. Those are my preferences. Um, I don't work for a pet food company, so I can tell you this with real experience and real honesty that our experiences have been that the Royal Canin diet that's made for pregnancy called HT42D does a great job of improving the micronutrient profile of what these dogs need to be eating. It comes in two forms. It comes in a large dog form and a small dog form, a large bag and a small bag correspondingly. You cannot buy it commercially at the store. You can only buy it from the Royal Canin website, but it's easy to sign up as a breeder and get signed up and get this product shipped to you. We recommend feeding it from just before the time that she should start into a heat cycle or the time she starts until the 42nd day of pregnancy, thus the name HT42D. So it stands for heat to the 42nd day of pregnancy. Um, so you can have it shipped to your home. It works really well. Um, and we've had good success with this in dogs that either haven't been cycling normally or dogs that we've had some fertility issues with. This explains the nutrient profile of what's in the HT42D. It has some micronutrients, including folic acid, tyrosine, um, some DHA and some other uh, products, beta carotenes and so forth, that seem to improve the bloody show during a heat cycle, improves the development of the uterus, uh, preparing for a pregnancy. It improves the growth of the follicles where the eggs are formed, the ovulation. It improves the formation of the placenta and the formation of the embryo, as well as maintaining the pregnancy. So these are the nutrients that you should be looking at. And like I said, there's only one company that makes a pregnancy diet. So anybody else that tells you that they're feeding an all-stage life stage product is not adequately addressing some of these smaller nutrient profiles that we need for dogs during pregnancy. Um, it is a soy-based diet. Um, I will mention that there is soy in this diet, but they chelate the phytoestrogens in this food. So if you look at the soy on the label, don't let that throw you off. The phytoestrogens have been chelated and removed from the food so it doesn't interfere with pregnancy and, and uh, the development of a normal um, pregnancy and lactation. After the 42nd day of pregnancy, so if we feed HT42D for the um, heat cycle until the 42nd day of pregnancy, then what do you feed for the last three weeks of the pregnancy? And the answer to that would be a puppy or a performance diet. This particular slide shows IMS and it has smart puppy on the label, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So these are diets, that, um, the Purina, the IMS, the Royal Canin, and the Hills diets are all appropriate for dogs during uh, late stage pregnancy and lactation. Um, I like the puppy diets. They do a great job of giving enough calcium and enough uh, ca calories that the dogs do a good job of being able to maintain the pregnancy and lactation. Then the next nutrient I want to talk about is folic acid. Folic acid is a really important nutrient in the development of healthy puppies and healthy babies. We know from studies in dogs and in humans that a folic acid deficiency can promote or lead to an increased risk of midline defects. Midline defects are going to include cleft palates, spina bifida, open abdominal walls, 
um, there's a number of midline defects that we see. And what a midline defect is, is when the right and the left side of the embryo don't grow together and form a normal body cavity. So folic acid can be used to reduce the is incidence or the risk of that. And it should be fed from about six weeks prior to the time that you want the female to become pregnant through to day 40 of the pregnancy. Uh, there is folic acid in Oxymate. There is folic acid in the Be Strong product. But um, you may need to increase the amount of that, particularly in some of the breeds that are at risk. There's only one published dose on this, and that is five milligrams per dog per day. So that's going to be several tablets, depending on what size you can find at the store. This is a grouping of two studies that were done on pugs and chihuahuas. Uh, you can see in this chart that there was an incidence of 10.86% and 15.78% in the pug and the chihuahua in the dogs without folic acid supplementation, and that dropped to about one-third to one-half of that amount when the uh, females were fed folic acid as a supplement. So you can see that there's a significant reduction, and these two breeds, the pugs and the chihuahuas, the brachycephalic short-faced dogs, are the ones that are at increased risk of cleft palates. Now, that doesn't mean they're the only breeds that have cleft palates. We can see them in any breed. Um, they can also be related to using certain drugs like trimethoprim sulfa during pregnancy. So it's really important that we're avoiding those drugs and that we're using folic acid supplements on dogs at risk. This is a picture of a puppy that has all three of the midline defects I just mentioned. On the left-hand picture, you can see that there's a puppy. This yellow lab puppy has a cleft palate. You can see that slit through the roof of the mouth. In the right-hand picture of the same puppy, over the shoulders, you can see that red dot. That's a spina bifida lesion where the spinal cord didn't adequately fuse. And then if you look carefully between the puppy's back feet, you can see her intestines are exposed. Off to the left side of her is her placenta, but the, uh, between her back feet is intestines. So I apologize for the graphic pictures, but I think it's really helpful for you to see what happens with puppies that don't get adequate nutrition during pregnancy. The sixth nutrient we want to mention is DHA. DHA is a fatty acid, and we have good studies on this that shows that the fatty acid supplement helps to have smarter puppies. Uh, it's available in a lot of different forms. The Alaska Natural Salmon Oil is one of the products that Revival carries that has a DHA profile that's important for our dogs. I've got a couple studies here that I'm going to show you the sources from. We know that DHA supplementation does not cause any um, negative growth of the joints during pregnancy. So this is an important aspect is that we're doing no harm. And then we know from a study that Canine Companions for Independence done, which did, which is a service dog organization in California, uh, they did a study on 5,900 puppies. Uh, so it's a lot of puppies. We're not talking about this is not five or six puppies. This is 5,900. Uh, they found that in their females that were producing litters that the first litter of these puppies uh, th that these females had, that 50% of their puppies would graduate from the service dog program. But by the time they got to their fifth litter, they were down to graduating only about 25% of those females' puppies. So the question became, what's happening here that we're losing this many puppies because they're not smart enough to become the service dogs that we expect them to be if they're going to pull a wheelchair, uh, pick up your keys, carry your briefcase to your office, and get you a beer out of the refrigerator? what's happening to these puppies? And the answer turned out to be that the females were being depleted of DHA through subsequent pregnancies. So by supplementing DHA, they found that they could increase their graduation rate. As the um, females got older, they were still graduating larger numbers of puppies from their litters, which is a really important thing because these service dogs are very expensive for uh, these organizations to produce. I have personally raised six dogs for this program, so I have a pretty good handle on the quality of dogs that they have. They have a great breeding program, but you have to have great nutrition to go with that. So we know from the DHA studies, and this was a report from 2012, so this isn't brand new information, that DHA and some of the other fatty acids improved cognitive, which is brain, memory, psychomotor, immunologic, and retinal functions in growing dogs. So brains, immunology, their, their immune systems, and their eyes were all better developed on a, a DHA-rich diet. So important information for you to have when you're selling puppies to the people that want them to have good longevity and really smart little, little puppy kids. The next thing I want to mention is Be Strong. Be Strong comes in a new form now. It comes as a powder and it comes as well in the liquid. Uh, we're in the process of changing labeling so you can see that there's a couple of different products on this slide. But we know that Be Strong from our clinical uh, experience 
improves the quality and the frequency of heat cycles. So if we have a female that's being fed an appropriate diet of Purina, Royal Canin, Yucanuba, one of those diets, and she's not cycling with the frequency or not cycling at all that we would expect her to, that our first recommendation before we use any kind of drug intervention is to put her on Be Strong along with the appropriate nutrition. So a diet change, if that's indicated along with Be Strong mixed with the diet, seems to really make a big difference. One of my own personal technicians at our practice uh, had a dog that was three years old. She worked in my repro department, uh, not the dog, the technician, and she had come in and said that her female hadn't ever had a heat cycle. And because she works in my repro department, I'm pretty sure she knows what a heat cycle looks like. So I said to her, well, you know, what do you want to do about it? She said, well, I want to put her on a medication to bring her into heat because I want to have a litter. And I said, no, 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 not until we do Be Strong. So we put her on to Be Strong. I said, if in 14 days she's not in heat, then we'll talk about it again. And on the 14th day, she sent me a photograph of the dog's south end because she clearly had started her heat cycle. She went on to have seven puppies. They're a year old. I vaccinated them the other day. So we know that they've produced really well uh, as soon as we've got them cycling. So Be Strong can make a huge difference in the quality of the heat cycle and the frequency. So if you're having difficulty with fertility in your females, start by looking at nutrition and adding the B vitamins. Uh, we don't feel that there's probably enough B vitamins added to the commercial diets as it seems that they've changed over the years. So if you used to have no trouble and 10 years ago you started to see a change or you've changed nutrition uh, on the diet, take a look at this as a, as a possible uh, solution to your problem. Then the last nutrient that I want to specifically talk about is going to be calcium. We know that calcium is really important for labor as well as lactation, as well as producing milk. So it's it's not going to be possible for your female to have good uterine contractions if her calcium levels aren't high enough. The tricky part to this is not starting the calcium supplement too early. If you start it during the pregnancy, in the middle of the pregnancy, you're going to actually tell her parathyroid gland to stop producing the hormone that mobilizes calcium from her bones. So we don't want to start the calcium gel until either the day she goes into labor or the day prior to that because we don't want to suppress her parathyroid gland. So we'll start the calcium gel at the initiation of labor or shortly before that. The gel product works really quickly. It does as good a job in most cases as some of the injectable products. So we can use that to improve her uterine contractions and frequently um, either use no oxytocin or a very small amount of oxytocin if we do need it at all to improve uh, the quality of her labor contractions and the delivery of her puppies promptly enough that you have good healthy puppies coming out strong and breathing. However, her calcium needs just are starting at that point. She needs it as well through lactation. And it's especially important in small breed uh, females with large litters. So the photograph of this dog here that um, is clearly in distress, she's laying on her side. This is a dog that came to our practice. She had seven puppies. She's a little 12 pound dog. She was nursing seven puppies and she developed what's called eclampsia. It's the equivalent of milk fever in the dog. In cows, when they have milk fever, they become weak and flaccid and they go down. You'll see those down cows on the farm. But if you have a dog with eclampsia, instead they develop like seizure-like activity almost of their muscles. They're aware, they're conscious, they're not unconscious like a seizure, but they go into these satanic muscle contractions and it's really very, very miserable for the dog. Her temperature goes up and this will progress to her dying if we don't get intervention. So the gel will work much more quickly than a powder or a tablet. So during the time that she's lactating heavily, you're going to want to make sure that she's getting adequate amounts of calcium. Now, if you need to use an injectable calcium product, we can use the 10% uh, calcium gluconate um, injectable product. Occasionally, that becomes a difficult product to get. It goes on to back order, and then we have to use the large animal cow product, which is a 23%. You have to dilute that down with sterile water or with sterile saline or that will cause a chemical burn as an injection into the dog. We want to give that subcutaneously during labor or during an eclampsia episode so that you're not giving it intravenously. IV should only be given by a veterinarian with an EKG hooked up to the dog because it's risky. Uh, if you give calcium IV too quickly, you can cause a problem with the heart and you can lose the patient to that. So if you've ever been on the farm with a large animal veterinarian treating your milk fever cow, and you see that he or she has their knee against the cow's chest while they're running the IV of calcium in, they're not just leaning on the cow. I'm just going to tell you, my husband did dairy practice for 23 years. They're monitoring the dog's heart rate or the cow's heart rate during the time that they're administering that calcium. 
that if the heart rate starts to slow down, they pull their line and they stop giving calcium. Now, we also have a new calcium powder product. It's under the Breeders Edge label, so you can see the new product here. And it, I'll tell you, it tastes great. I've tried it. Um, tastes like vanilla pudding. Really good. So we've got a product here that we can use as a gel during labor, as a powder during lactation, as an injectable if we need it during an eclampsia episode or during labor. The next thing I want to talk about will be parasite control. Another really important thing that we do for our females to keep them and their puppies healthy. We'll talk about intestinal parasites, including roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, tapeworms, heartworm disease, and then the external parasites of fleas and ticks most commonly, and then the occasional mite or lice problem. So for intestinal parasites, for roundworms, hookworms, and whipworms, and one form of tapeworm, we can use fenbendazole on our pregnant dogs or on our puppies over the age of four weeks. Now this is an off-label dose. The label says to use fenbendazole for three days. It comes as a 10% suspension in this large bottle of uh, Panicure. It also comes as Safeguard and a couple of other labels. But this works really well as a suspension. Uh, and the way we recommend using it is to give one cc of the suspension per four pounds of body weight to the adult female pregnant dog. And we give it for the last three weeks of the pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation. So a total of five weeks. And I know the label says three days, and I understand that, and I can read it, but we know that it's very safe. And since about the 1990s, we've been giving this protocol to our females. And what we find is because we've done this protocol, we are now producing puppies that are born without parasites. If the female, when she was a young dog, ever had intestinal parasites, those parasites insist in her muscles, and the stress of lactation and the stress of pregnancy reactivate the migration of those, just like trichinosis back in the old days with the pigs. They start to migrate through the uh, female's circulation into the milk and into the placenta and into the puppies. So this is why you can have puppies at two weeks of age that already have heavy intestinal parasite loads. So by interfering with that life cycle, with this product, with this protocol of the last three weeks of lactation and the first two weeks of, pre of uh, I'm sorry, the last three weeks of pregnancy and the first two weeks of lactation, we can very easily interrupt this life cycle and prevent the development of these puppies with roundworms and hookworms. It also will interrupt the life cycle that ends up causing the possibility of children or other people that are exposed to parasites developing a zoonotic disease from the parasite. So instead of waiting until we have puppies that are five weeks old, you're weaning them at four and five weeks and they're kind of getting diarrhea and they're kind of puny and they don't feel very good and they're not thrifty and they're, they've got little belly aches and they, they aren't eating and they've got diarrhea, we can get ahead of this by doing this protocol. And you're going to have these fat, healthy, wonderful puppies. I have clients that come to the practice now, throw their arms around me and say, Dr. Greer, I have never seen such healthy puppies. I've been breeding for 40 years. I love this protocol. This is awesome. So this works. It works really well. The important thing to know is you can deworm the female and deworm her and deworm her, and she can have a negative fecal sample and you'll still have intestinal parasites in your puppies because the muscles have these uh, parasitic cysts in them. So it's not that you haven't dewormed her before you got her pregnant, it's just you've got to deworm during the pregnancy to interrupt this life cycle migration. The second parasite I wanna mention is gonna be heartworm disease. We see a lot of uh, dogs in the southern tier of states with heartworm. So it's important that we have our dogs on an appropriate heartworm preventive year round, uh, even in the northern states. There are many heartworm preventives on the market. Many of them are milbamycin or ivermectin based. Those will be Sentinel, Interceptor, HeartGuard, TriHeart, all those, they're, they're all uh, safe, but Trifexis, and I don't wanna call out one specific product, but Trifexis, doesn't have any safety label on the product. So be very careful that you're reading labels on your medications, um, both for the heartworm medication and the flea and tick medication. So flea and tick medications will usually also manage mites and lice. There are two forms of those medications. There's a topical, that's the um, liquid that goes up the back, uh, over the shoulders and up the back of the dog. Some of those are safe during pregnancy. Some of those are not. We know Frontline is. We know Vectra is not, so you need to read your labels. There are four oral medications. Brevecto is the only one labeled as safe. Semperica, Credelio, and NextGuard are not tested. So it's not saying that we're calling them out on anything. It's just saying that the label doesn't indicate if it's safe or not. So I don't want your dog to be the test dog in the study that determines that it wasn't safe. 
So I think it's really important that you read labels and use an appropriate product for your uh, female dogs. And pay attention to the males as well because it frequently won't indicate males are tested either. So the Bebecca label specifically says there were no clinically relevant treatment related effects on the body weight, food consumption, reproductive performance, semen analysis, litter data, gross necropsy, or histo histology on adults or puppies. This is what Brevecto says. Cordelio, Nexgard, and Semperica don't say that. So pay attention to your labels. If you read the labels on the heartworm preventives, I'm jumping around a little bit here just to compare things. Uh, we know that HeartGuard, which is the ivermectin-based product, says safe on breeding females, stud dogs, and puppies aged six or more weeks. And then Trifexis says, used with caution in breeding females, the safe use of Trifexis in breeding males has not been evaluated. So my thoughts on this is if they haven't tested it in the males and we don't know if it can be safely used in females, I just wouldn't use it in a facility where I had breeding animals. I just think it's smart to say, stay with products that we know have safety uh, indications on them. The third uh, category of flea and tick medication is the Seresto collar. And again, that's not labeled as safe. Um, in male or females at this point. So I would stick with the products that we know are. So read your labels, read your labels. If you're not sure how to read the label, Google it. You can find the PDF, talk to your veterinarian, call our pharmacy at Revival. We've got all this information there for you to help you select products that you can safely have your dogs on heartworm preventive, intestinal parasite control, and flea and tick parasite control safely during the, all stages of reproduction. The sixth category of things we want to talk are going to be environment, which will be ventilation, biosecurity, temperature, lighting, waste, water quality, inner dog relationships, and bathing. So we'll go through some of these fairly quickly because we uh, have so much material we could just cover this in a lot of detail. But I think in general, uh, you know that you need to have good ventilation in your facilities. I've seen facilities, pictures of facilities that don't have the upper part of the building uh, the interior isn't finished. It has exposed insulation. It has places that moisture can accumulate. So those are going to cause problems with humidity. Too much urine accumulation will cause ammonia issues. And ammonia can be very irritating to the airways, especially in little puppies. So make sure your facility is clean and that you've got good airflow through the facility. Here's a really nice kennel setup with good uh, exhaust fans. You can see this is the interior of the building and the same building from the exterior. So you can see the size of these fans that's moving air through there effectively, which will reduce the ammonia and reduce the humidity. Air quality is really important. There are a lot of people that like to use essential oils. We don't know if some of those are safe during pregnancy and lactation. Um, we do have some anecdotal reports of people that have started using essential oils and had fertility issues and they stopped and the fertility issues disappeared. So think about what you're using and think about the cigarette smoke. If you're a smoker, smoke outside. Don't smoke with the dog in the house. Don't smoke with the dog in the kennel. Remember that we see low birth weight babies and dogs just as well as we do in humans. So be careful with your cigarette smokes as well. The second thing we want to talk about is biosecurity. And that's going to be reducing the bacteria, parasite, and viral loads of um, visitors to your facility. So you want to make sure anybody that comes to visit has washed their hands with soap and water. Uh, those Hand sanitizers are not sufficient. You need to remove the organic material with soap and water, use something antibacterial. Um, there's lots of good products on the market. If you're having them come to visit to hold puppies, make them wear their jackets, take their jackets off that they've been wearing as an outer uh, garment and either have them take their shoes off or walk through a foot bath so that you can disinfect the shoes of people coming into your facility. They can carry in things like parvovirus and parasites. And you wanna keep your puppies healthy at the same time that you want visitors to be able to come see them. So be very cautious with how you're managing your biosecurity. Temperature is really important in the kennels. I personally like heat sources for my puppies from the underneath of the puppies, not above. Um, heat lamps and uh, that type of heat source make me nervous. I set one of my barns on fire with a heat lamp. So I think that you have to be very cautious with the use of those uh, types of heat sources. But the um, heat sources from underneath this is, um, in this picture, this is a whelping box with a T.E. Scott whelping nest in it. Um, T.E. Scott makes this as an electric box, and I know some of the um, other um, producers will have other sources like LP and uh, natural gas and some other ways that batteries that you can use as a heat source. Um, so if, if the uh, facility doesn't have electricity, you do have a way that you can still heat from underneath. 
but this uh, heated nest is really great because the puppies are attracted to the heat source if they're chilled. So this is a litter of 10 corgi puppies. And as you can see, there are five puppies that are warm enough that they're off on their um, whelping pads by themselves. And then there's five puppies that thought that they were a little chilled so that they would move on to the disc. So the nice thing about this is it doesn't dehydrate, it doesn't start a fire. Uh, your female can lay off the whelping nest next to the puppies and they can nurse over, crawl over and nurse off of her, but she's not subjected to the heat. So you can keep your environmental area at 70 to 75 degrees and the whelping surface, I start at 90 degrees for the first week. And then I lower that temperature by about five degrees a week until we get to room temperature. So 90 the first week, 85 the second and so on. We also have a product at Revival called the Puppy Warmer. It comes as two units. It comes as an incubator, which you can see in this picture on the left, that you can very specifically set the temperature in the environment. Um, it is set up to have a temperature gradient in this um, incubator as well as, as what we did on the nest, because we know puppies want to move to sources that they're comfortable in. So if they're too warm, they can move away. If they're too cool, they can move toward the heat source. And um, Ken at Puppy Warmer developed this product to have a heat gradient in it. You can use this for newborn puppies, the very first when they come out at C-section or as vaginal births if they're wet and cold. You can warm them up very quickly in this. And then the other unit on the right-hand side is the oxygen concentrator. What the oxygen concentrator does is it takes room air, uh, which is 20% oxygen, and turns it into 95% oxygen without an oxygen tank by simply plugging this in and running the unit into the incubator. So you can in, uh, create an oxygen enriched environment with these two units. Uh, we do sell them either individually as a set, but they are awesome. You'll buy this once and they will last you the rest of your breeding career. They are the most terrific setup that you have, especially if you have brachycephalic puppies, um, pugs, Frenchies, bulldogs, uh, breeds that tend to be weak or, or sick puppies. You'll save puppies with this. It's just an amazing setup. So again, this just emphasizes, this slide emphasizes the importance of using a heat source from underneath, not above the, the puppies. <clears throat> the next thing we want to talk about is lighting in the kennel. Day length is an important way for us to manage our dog's heat cycles. We know dogs don't cycle as frequently when the days are short in the wintertime as they do during um, the rest of the year. Uh, long about January 1st, you know, because the days start to get longer on December 22nd, by January 1st, we've got dogs coming out of our ears that are in heat in our practice. So again, uh, day length is really important to our dogs. And if you're having difficulty with cycling, you need to get those females outside more. You may want to change the lighting in the kennel to a full spectrum daylight type of lighting. Don't turn the lights off in the kennel uh, during the uh, afternoons and evenings. You may need to turn those on so that you have 12 to 14 hours of daylight in the kennel to improve the female's likelihood of cycling. So keep that in mind if you're struggling with heat cycles. Uh, or females that aren't, aren't cycling normally. Waste, of course, is a really important uh, item that we need to keep our, our kennels clear of. So this is a raised kennel. Uh, you can raise children in it as well, I guess, um, judging from this nice little kid. Um, but having the dogs up on an elevated surface or keeping the kennels clean so that frequently you're moving the um, waste out is important. You need to eliminate the waste, but you also need to use a surfactant like a soap to eliminate the organic material before you disinfect. So you cannot over disinfect. You can't get rid of all the parasites and all the bacteria and all the things you need to get rid of by simply disinfecting. You have to eliminate the waste. You have to get rid of the large material. You have to get rid of it with a surfactant, a soap, and then um, be careful when you are spraying to clean because you can end up with some pretty large amounts of um, aerosolized uh, waste products that you can end up breathing or the dogs can end up breathing, so be careful with that. Water quality, uh, water is the number one nutrient that our dogs take in. Second, uh, it's, it's only seconded by the food that they eat. So remember, water quality is really essential, good water quality. If you're struggling with dogs with diarrhea or some illnesses that you can't fully understand, have your water tested for coliforms, for nitrates. Um, your county extension agency can usually run these at a very low cost. And take in several water samples. Don't just take it from your kitchen sink. Take it from anywhere in the kennel, um, any kind of hose bib or, or um, water source that you're using in the kennel, because you can have leaks in the water system and you can have contamination uh, in the kennel or in um, the facility that you may not have in the drinking water that you're using for yourself and your family. So check multiple sources if you're going to go to the trouble of doing this. 
Uh, your water should be clear of coliforms. Coliforms are the bacteria that cause um, the diarrhea, and it's the, the bacteria that should be in stool. So you don't want fecal contamination in your water source. And of course, nitrates are an agricultural byproduct that can end up in water sources as well. Interdog relationships and stress are really um, sometimes overlooked by people. If you've got crowding, if you've got breeds of dogs that don't necessarily like to get along well together, if you've got Shiba Inus or Corgis or Malamutes, dogs that tend to be um, a little bit aggressive toward one another, too much stress, too much um, intermingling of dogs, too many dogs staring at uh, a litter of puppies making a new mom nervous. Those are all things that can increase stress levels uh, that don't improve mothering skills. She really needs to have a nice quiet environment where she feels safe to raise her puppies well. So use housing as a good way um, to manage that. Keep your housing not so overcrowded that they're feeling stressed. And if you're still struggling with that, something like the Thunder Ease Diffuser Kit or the Thunder Ease Collar can be really helpful in improving maternal skills. So these are products that you can purchase. Um, we use a collar on all of our females that we do C-sections on. We try to put that Thunder Ease collar on two to three days before her C-section. And we find that we have much calmer mothers, much better moms when we, when we manage them that way. So remember, don't invite the neighbors over. Don't have too much crowding in the kennel. Your dog needs a nice, quiet place to raise her puppies. And then bathing is our last step. Prior to the time she whelps, a good chlorhexidine bath is a really good um, uh, practice to, to take part in. It redu re uh, reduces the bacteria and reduces the parasites that she may have on her skin. Um, she may have around her um, rectal area. So there's several good chlorhexidine products on the market. We've got uh, a product at Revival that's a chlorhexidine bath. So it's a great cleansing, um, smells really good uh, bath to give the female two or three days before she has the puppies just to make sure she's good and clean. Her mammary glands are clean and her um, rectal area is clean. You might want to consider shaving some of the hair off of the mammary glands just to make it easier for puppies to find their way to the, to the um, nipples so that they can nurse better. Timing the breeding, of course, is a really essential step in making sure that we have good breeding outcomes. You can use behavior as one indicator of when she's ready to breed, but vaginal cytologies improve that, and progesterone tests improve that even further. So if you want to have nice big litters with nice um, quality puppies, it's really important that we know exactly when she ovulated so that we can breed her, but it's also important we know when she ovulated so we know what the end of the pregnancy should be. So you can be present, so you can schedule a C-section. So if she gets into a situation that she's in preterm labor, you can intervene with that. Um, this is a litter of 11 Cavalier King Charles Spaniel puppies. So one breeding, 11 puppies, that's good fertility. So behavior is useful, but it's not the only thing that you can use. Um, this is a female corgi that belonged to me and then one of the males. Um, she was very receptive, as you can see from the position of her hips, but um, the male was just a little inept, so we ended up needing to do an AI to, to intervene with this. So we had indications that she was ready to breed, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get these guys that are kind of, they're not too smart. You know, they want to play ball. They, they don't really figure it all out. So sometimes we do have to intervene, and that's where either a cytology or a progesterone can be helpful. Now, vaginal cytologies are easy to do, and we can um, have these done at the veterinary clinic. Some people do these on their own. All it takes is a cotton swab that you put well up into the bitch's vaginal tract, um, spin it around, and then we put it onto a microscope slide, stain it, and look at it microscopically. This is a slide of a female in proestrus, so before she's ready, so she's in heat, but she's not ready to breed yet. You can see these are large cells that are lightly staining with the purple nucleus, that purple dot in the middle. Um, is the nucleus. This is what proestrus looks like. And those little gray ghosty cells in the background are red blood cells. Those are an indication that she's still in proestrus. As she goes further into estrus and is actually in the fertile part of her period, uh, you can see that these cells are now no longer light staining and nice and round, but they're angular looking and they've largely lost their nucleus. So they stain more darkly. You can no longer see the purple nucleus in the middle. And then as she goes out of heat, we again see the nucleus come back, the cells become more light stained. And now instead of red blood cells, the ghosty cells in the background, we can see white blood cells in the background, which are normal at diestrus, but not normal at proestrus. 
So the other advantage of doing these cytologies is if we see white blood cells early in the heat cycle, that tells us that she may have a bacterial infection vaginally and we need to manage those. So these are the three slides combined together, so you can see all three at the same time. The center slide is the one where she's in the uh, fertile stage of her period, or her heat period. So this is when you want to use her for breeding. Prior to that is proestrus, and after that is diestrus. So these are uh, stages of the heat cycle that are useful, but not ready to breed during. Basically what you need are cotton swabs, a microscope, and some, slide, some stains uh, for slides. So these can be purchased and uh, used as a way that you can manage the dog's breeding, but it's still not as good as progesterone testing. So timing our breedings with progesterone is the most accurate way we can determine when she ovulates, which tells us, like I said, two things. One is when to do the breeding. Um, and the advantage of progesterone testing is that they're very accurate. They're easy to interpret. Anybody can figure out how to read these results. They're widely available, so they can be used uh, both on the human uh, progesterone testing and on veterinary, and it's reproducible. So if you took the same blood sample to three labs, you would get similar, not identical, but similar results. So instead of having a staff member with a crystal ball, and mine is in the shop, um, we can much more accurately determine when the female should be bred. This is the IDEX, the new IDEX machine. It's been on the market a little bit over a year, uh, and about 60% of veterinary hospitals in the U.S. have this in the hospital. So again, it's an easy test to run. Many veterinary clinics have the equipment. They just need to add the uh, reagents and the, the wells to their order if you decide that you want to have your veterinary clinic start doing progesterone testing with you. So there are two reasons we want to do progesterone testing. One is to time the breeding, like I said, to make sure we get the, the breeding done at the right time. And the second is to know when to time our C-sections. So you may have a veterinarian that's willing to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do C-sections for your bulldog but those are increasingly hard to find. And we know that it's not good on the staff and it's not good on the doctors not to get a full night's sleep and it's not good for you either. So by timing our progesterones, we know exactly what day to do our C-sections from the day that we do the breeding. And that's pretty cool because your veterinarian's gonna be a lot happier if all your C-sections are done during the day. So this push me pull you here in this slide is just a reminder that we need to know both ends of the pregnancy not just when to get the semen put in, but when we want to take the puppies out. So we do our C-sections in our practice 62 days after they ovulate for almost all breeds, unless they're bulldogs or bully breeds like the Frenchies and the Pugs, or unless they're carrying a really large litter. So if I have a golden retriever that's pregnant with 14 puppies, she's probably going to have her C-section 61 days after she ovulates. I'll, the other breeds with smaller litters will be 62 days. And our, in our lab, we call ovulation five nanograms. Some labs will call it four, some labs will call it eight, but somewhere in that range of four to eight is where ovulation occurs. So this graph just helps you to kind of identify how progesterone works. Progesterone doesn't actually um, signal ovulation. The LH peak does, but the LH peak is very short, and you can only test for that if you test every 24 hours. So most of the time, testing every 24 hours for a female is not very practical, so that's why progesterone testing has become the, the hormone of choice. No one does estrogen testing in commercial labs, so that is on the graph simply for educational purposes, but not because it's useful in a clinical setting. So we know progesterone starts to rise as soon as the LH peak occurs. LH stands for luteinizing hormone, and that's the hormone that actually creates the ovulation. So female dogs are different than other species. They are not fertile the day they ovulate. Dogs need two to three days for their eggs to mature. Cows are fertile the day they ovulate. Cats are fertile the day they ovulate. Dogs, not so much. Dogs wait two to three days for their ovulation, uh, after their ovulation, for their eggs to become fertile. So we want to breed two days after ovulation with fresh semen, if we're using fresh, a natural breeding or fresh chilled semen, and three days if we're using frozen semen. So it's really important that we have good timing, especially on our frozen semen breedings. So this just shows that there is an estrus cycle that dogs are always doing something with their ovaries. It never ends, but the fertile period is very short. We only usually have about 24 to 48 hours for good fertility during a six-month time period. So I just want to briefly mention that I do have a book. It's available through Revival Animal Health. It's on canine breeding and neonatology, so it's useful. It goes chronologically through the time that you're thinking about 
using a dog for breeding and the health screenings that you want to do in advance of that through uh, the, the heat cycle, the pregnancy, how to manage pregnancies, how to manage uh, whelpings, and how to manage neonates, and as well as male fertility. So it's a pretty comprehensive book. So I want to thank everybody for hanging in there. It's a, a pretty intense hour of information. So I uh, appreciate you joining us today. And remember, you can come back and watch this in our Learning Center at any point. Just want to say thanks again. And now we'll have a few questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Greer. Um, that information was extremely helpful and I hope everybody got a lot of uh, great tips out of that. We do have a few questions. And so one of the questions that we got was regards to the food and the diet. Um, a lot of people are wondering why no potatoes in nutrition? And as a follow-up to that, somebody asked, what about sweet potatoes? Is that, are they okay? The potatoes and the sweet potatoes are probably okay, but they tend to be paired with the peas, legumes, and, and uh, beans. So it's probably those are the products that are the offenders. It's just that they had to put some other source of carbohydrate into the diet, and that's not an adequate amount of carbohydrates for most dogs during pregnancy and lactation. So I would just encourage people to use the diets that are corn, wheat, and those are not, those are not dirty words. Those are great nutrients that we see in many, many dog foods. So the, the corn, wheat, barley, oats, milo, unless you have an allergic dog, um, dogs are gonna generally be better off on those types of sources of carbohydrates than they are on the other. So potatoes and sweet potatoes aren't a bad thing. They're just not um, frequently seen in the mainstream diet. Okay, okay that's good to know. Um, somebody else was wondering, what is the best way to breed a virgin female? Um, what method do you recommend? What semen type? in that situation. Sure, and a lot of people recommend that you do a breeding first with fresh semen and not frozen semen, just to be sure that you have a fertile female before you spend the money on shipping the expensive fresh chilled or the really expensive frozen semen. Uh, so a natural breeding is ideal. We tend to see our biggest litters with natural breeding bigger than with most frozen and fresh chilled breedings, um, even bigger than vaginal AIs. Um, so hopefully you have a female that's cooperative and if you use an experienced male, one that's a gentleman, but one that's an experienced male, those usually create the best breeding. So if you put an inexperienced male with an inexperienced female, a lot of times you get a lot of nothing. So it works best to use somebody with some experience and the breeder included. So if you're inexperienced at breeding, you may want to find a veterinarian or a co-breeder that would be helpful in helping you get the first breeding done because those can be a little bit of a challenge. Absolutely, great tip there for sure. Um, is there anything that they, somebody is asking, if there is anything they can do to help increase fertility and eggs in their female and to kind of predict the best way for a planned C-section? Um, I know you, you did touch on that a little bit, but they were just wanting a little bit more on that. Sure, sure. So really progesterone is gonna be our best way to know. Um, and like I said, the B strong and the appropriate nutrients in a commercially available diet tend to see where we see the largest litters. So it's really important that we're not um, feeding some off-brand diet. You know, what you save on dog food isn't really going to save you money. It ends up costing you money as you lose uh, the opportunity to have larger litters. So good quality nutrition, be strong, and then good timing. It, it costs a little bit of money to do progesterone testing. It costs a little bit of money to buy good dog food. But if you have a litter of one and end up with a C-section, that costs you money too. So we really like to have nice big litters. I like litters of eight and nine puppies. I, I think those are the ones that are the most um, fruitful for everybody involved. Absolutely. Um, a couple more questions here. Uh, and again, you kind of touched on this, but wondering what is your calcium protocol? Well, during early labor, I'll start with the gel. Uh, and then sometimes I will send injectable products home with clients, depending on the circumstances, especially if they have whelp wise or they have a history of calcium deficiencies. So injectable calcium, if it's the 10% or, or an appropriately, appropriately diluted 23% calcium can be used effectively. The gel works really well, but things like Tums, those Tums and ice cream, they're not gonna be bioavailable fast enough. You're not gonna get enough uh, calcium into the female during labor. So you really need to use an appropriate calcium product. And many times you don't need any oxytocin or just a tiny, tiny dose of oxytocin paired with calcium will get you a really effective labor pattern and really 
um, a, a good effective whelping pattern. Okay, um, last question here. And at, at the beginning of your talk, you talked a lot about the canine brucellosis. Is there an in-home test for this or is that something that must be done by your vet? Yeah, at this point, we don't have an in-home test. They come as tests of 20, I, I think 10 and 25. So most people are not gonna find that to be a practical thing for them to use at home. Uh, your veterinarian is, if your veterinarian is working with you and a couple of other breeders, they can generally have enough volume to make it worth their while to have the test kit in house. And like I said, it's simple. You're gonna do a progesterone test on your female anyway. At that time, you can do her first brucellosis test. Um, if you're concerned that she might be positive, you can test before she comes into heat. And of course, the male should be tested at least twice a year, if not more often, if he's being used frequently. So most people just use their veterinary clinic for testing. Okay, good to know. Well, thank you again, Dr. Greer. You gave us sure. so much great information here. And if you're watching and you have more questions, please reach out. Our pet care pros are always help, happy to help answer questions. If they don't know the answer, they will reach out to Dr. Greer and get the answer. So, you know, give them a call 1-800-786-4751 and they will get any questions you have answered. So happy to talk to them. <laughs> have a great day. Thank you.